dates and stuff like that. I don't mind going first. Um, it, it's up to I, I don't care. Just whoever, whatever gets decided, I, I can go with it. <laughs> well, my shorts have been blowing up. I got uh, almost 4,500 subs this month almost. And sweet. Four million views. That is right a lot. on. Juicy. Averaging a million a week. That's huge. What have you done different? Shorts. Ah. Oh. See, yeah. I had the opposite issue with, with granted, my channel is tiny, tiny compared to yours. But I was doing great with shorts until March 1st. And then all of a sudden, all the reach just dropped right out. Yeah, they updated the algorithm, but uh, I had one of mine get 600, 700,000, one get 400, like seven get like 100,000. That is indeed huge. And okay, we should be good to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on screen and I'm going to say, this is where when I do a cold open in about 60 seconds, I'll say, hey, everybody, today we're debating evolution on trial and we are starting right now and then this is uh since it's not a yes no question there's no clear affirmative does either side have a preference on who wants to go first i can go first cool i'll say with the evolution side and i'll say with tom i'll say tom from the evolution side floor is all yours and at that point just like usual you can pick it up pick up the ball and start running and then uh, Good, looks great. All right, here we go. Uh, first, I'm going to start the stream. They won't be able to see or hear us, but this is just to be sure the connection's good. 99% of the time, it's good. And yeah, this will be fun. Thanks for coming on, guys. This is always fun for me. It gives me an extra spring in my step. And hello, everyone. A lot of We've fun. We've talked a lot yeah. on this channel. All these people in the live chat. I just see some of these trolls. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, but I like the freedom. If they want to, hey, just FYI, James. Um, right now, my house is relatively empty, and I've got peace and quiet, and the door's locked. But people are going to show up in a little while, so if I have to duck out, I will try and be back as quickly as possible. No problem. Thanks for letting me know. And here I go. And then, yeah, I'll update the uh, title as we go. Cause, uh... but here we go. Thanks, guys. Here I go in three, two, one, ready, set, here I go. Hey everybody, tonight we're debating evolution on trial and we are starting right now with the evolution side's opening statement in particular. Tom, thanks for being with us. The floor is all yours. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to share sound here. Uh, and I think this is the right video. Share can you guys see it? Hello, everyone. We've talked a lot on this. Yep. Cool. This channel about how evolution is used to understand the past. But today, we're going to talk about how evolution can be used to predict the future. So, let's jump right in. As we've mentioned on this channel before, the hallmark of a good theory is its ability to make predictions. Anyone can make up an ad hoc rationalization to explain away data that contradicts a particular model. But not every model can be used to make accurate predictions about future data. If the evolution of all organisms from a set of common ancestors is true, then we should be able to test that. As it happens, we can. We can test it in numerous ways, with morphology, ecology, biogeography, genetics, and with fossils. So, let's take some examples. Darwin himself provided numerous predictions. One of the most famous was the prediction of a pollinating insect that possessed a proboscis with an absurd length that could reach down inside the flower of a peculiar species of orchid from Madagascar that held its nectar deep inside a long tube. This insect was eventually found, a moth called Xanthopan. Darwin also observed that the bones inside the wings of birds looked like they were fingers that got fused together. So he predicted that a fossil of an ancient bird with separate fingers would be found one day. This ended up being Archaeopteryx. The first specimen was discovered just two years after the publication of Darwin's book on the origin of species. But the evolutionary predictions didn't end there. An example of a modern prediction of evolution is one we have discussed at length. The chromosome 2 fusion, including all its details such as the telomeric repeats at the fusion site, two centromeres, one of which is deactivated, as well as the conserved sensitivity between chromosome 2 and the two that remain separate in the other great apes, which can only be predicted based on common descent. Not only was the fusion predicted, but creationists have been completely unable to refute it. But since we already made a video about that, we're going to leave it there. The prevalence of mutations in organisms even allows researchers to make predictions about their prevalence in populations. For example, there are different types of mutations, such as mutations from guanine to thymine or from cytosine to adenine, etc. These mutations occur at different rates in the human population, so are found at different frequencies. Using these frequencies, we can generate a graph like this, showing the signature of mutations. If mutations were also the cause of interspecies genetic differences, then we would predict a similar spectrum graph when counting up the different types of nucleotide differences between humans and chimps. And we do. 
In fact, the spectrum also matches when you look at the differences between humans and more distantly related apes like gorillas and orangutans, and matches when comparing differences between those other apes such as chimps and gorillas. This makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model. Under creationism, it implies that a creator created interspecies DNA differences that just so happen to look exactly as though they had occurred by the same natural processes that give rise to within-species differences. It also makes no sense under a non-evolutionary model why genetic sequences for homologous proteins converge the further you go back in time, which was, by the way, also predicted under evolution. When we reconstruct ancestral sequences from different groups of species, we find that those ancestral sequences are more similar to one another than the descendant species, implying a branching pattern of divergence that fits the evolutionary model of common descent perfectly. Researchers also sometimes make predictions about specific genetic homologies in organisms. Michael Coates wrote the 2003 The Evolution of Paired Fins, when he specifically notes the homologies between scapulocoracoid or pectoral fin cartilage and certain branchial or gill arch cartilage. His abstract ends with this, quote, no transformation of arch to girdle is necessarily implied, but some signal of developmental relatedness is predicted, close quote. And sure enough, the 2009 paper, Shared Developmental Mechanisms Pattern of Vertebrate Gill Arch and Paired Fin Skeletons by Gillis, Don, and Shubin, found, quote, the molecular patterning of chondrichthy and branchial rays, gill rays, and reveal profound developmental similarities between gill rays and vertebrate appendages, close quote. Another example of a very precise prediction concerns our yolk, or rather lack thereof. As all amniotes, our embryonic development is typified by the formation of several membranes, among them the amnion, hence the name. These membranes retain the moisture for the embryo, which allowed amniotes to invade dry land. Most amniotes lay eggs that contain a massive yolk sac filled with nutrients, which allowed for the development to be more complete before birth, without the need for a post birth metamorphosis stage, as is the case with amphibians. Egg laying is the ancestral reproductive state of amniotes, and there are still a few mammals around that do this, like the monotremes. However, eutherian mammals like us have a placenta that made the yolk sac obsolete, but curiously, we still have a vestigial yolk sac that doesn't have any yolk in it. All of this points to the conclusion that our ancestors once laid eggs containing a yolk sac filled with yolk. And yolk is mostly protein coated by genes. So if eutherians are descended from amniotes that once laid eggs with yolk, we should expect to see leftovers of these genes in our genome, and we do. They are broken, but they are still there, and when compared to their functional homologs and other amniotes, they also have the same neighboring genes. This is called a shared syntony, which is also a predicted phenomenon as a direct consequence of common descent. Aside from genetic predictions, evolution also makes fossil predictions. First, Robert Broom predicted the existence of an amniote with a double hinged jaw joint based on the idea that mammals evolved from the colloquially called reptiles. The jaw joint of ancestral amniotes is formed by the articulation between the articular and quadrate bones, all that of mammals is between the dentary and squamosal. Broom deduced that the only plausible way for this transition to have happened is that, at one point, both jaw joints were together at the same time. And this was discovered decades later in Probane Ignathus and a whole host of other near mammal fossils. William Beebe predicted that birds should have gone through a stage in their evolution where they had asymmetrical flight feathers on their front and back legs. He predicted this by the fact that Archaeopteryx had sparse flight feathers on its hind legs, which weren't enough to be useful for flight, so he thought they were vestigial, indicating that an ancestral stage with bigger feathers on the hindlands existed. This was found in the form of Microraptor. Also in relation to birds, a feather morphotype was predicted by embryological data and later found in dinosaurs, such as Bipiosaurus. Paleontologists predicted an ant fossil that had features of wasps in the Cretaceous, and that was confirmed as Sphigomirma. Neil Shubin and colleagues predicted a fish-like tetrapod or tetrapod-like fish, and at that stage would there be much difference, in Devonian strata of Canada, and that was confirmed as Tiktaalik. Researchers long predicted the existence of sauropods in the Triassic, and that was confirmed as Isanosaurus from Thailand. Recently, a semi-aquatic whale ancestor was found named Paragocetus. This cetacean has a flattened tail like a beaver, which was useful for propelling it through the water. It also showed how the earliest marine whales migrated from their place of origin near India to the Americas. Later whales, such as Basilosaurus, had tail flukes, while earlier whales, such as Pachycetus, had thinner tails that would not have been especially useful for swimming. Paragocetus fits in directly between these with a tail shape predicted by researchers. The list goes on, but the point is that there's no reason for these predictions to have been fulfilled if different clades of organisms were created separately from each other, as imagined both in the flood geology and intelligent design models. Then there's biogeography. Geologists have worked out that the crust of the Earth has changed much throughout its history, and organisms have had to adapt to it. Regarding this, researchers correctly predicted that fossil marsupials would be found specifically in the Eocene strata in Antarctica, since they moved from South America to Australia at a time when these land masses were connected by Antarctica. The same is true for many dinosaurs and plants predicted for even earlier times based on what was alive in the then adjacent land masses of the Mesozoic. So, what does all of this mean? It means that evolution works. It makes accurate, specific predictions about what should be found both in the fossil record and our own genomes. To quote younger creationist Todd Wood, quote, Evolution is not a theory in crisis. It is not teetering on the verge of collapse. It has not failed as a scientific explanation. There is evidence for evolution, gobs and gobs of it, close quote. Or to quote younger creationist Carl Wise, right, quote, Thank you very much. We will kick it over to Ember as well. Thanks very much, Ember. First timer, we're glad to have you here. The floor is all yours. All right. right, let's. Uh, let me find that screen share button and we will do the thing. <laughs> boo, boo, boo. Alt, oh, I have four. to actually open the files first, don't I? Okay, open the file. This is the fun of being a first timer, folks. Oh, where is it? If you're listening out there right now, I want to say, folks, as you're waiting, if it's your first time at Modern Day Debate, we are a neutral channel hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. I'm your host, James. Oh, we hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from. And we'll kick it back over to Amber for his opening. All right. Is that showing up, folks? Yep. Cool. Okay. Now I need to be over here so I can control my buttons. Okay. So six minutes. Let's do this. Is evolution science? So first, what is science? Science Definitions vary for tonight's purposes. Let's say science is not about being right. It's about building models that make it possible for us to understand reality that make useful, accurate predictions. Um, um, evolution could be replaced tomorrow or in a hundred years by a model that does better, like relativity has been. Uh, you know, we've got uh, Einstein's relativity replaced Newton's, which replaced Galileo's. That's our evolution of ideas, if you will. Um, for evolution itself, definition, 
Simple definition for tonight's purposes, a change in the heritable traits of a population over time. I included a couple of uh, Darwin's moths there. We may get into the significance of them throughout the course of the night, maybe not, but they're pretty anyway. There are vast quantities of data supporting evolution. Uh, for one thing, we can see the changes in the heritable traits of a bull terrier over the last hundred years. For another example, we've got wild mustard, which through the selection of traits, we humans have turned into cabbage and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and cauliflower and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, we've got carcinization. That's uh, that principle, everything turns into crabs. That's one example of convergent evolution, just like birds and insects and bats all developed wings. Same thing with uh, the body shape of the dolphin, which is reflected in the ichthyosaur and the shark. These are all examples of how evolution keeps moving towards the same structures for optimal use in a given environment because it's environmental selection pressure that drives it. There's testable, observable predictions. We have used evolution to select for traits to get more from our agriculture. We get 2.5 times more milk from our dairy cows than we did 50 years ago. We get two times more corn per acre than we did 70 years ago. We predicted and then unfortunately observed antibiotic resistant bacteria. And then, of course, there's the famous wall lizards of the Mediterranean, where biologists took five breeding pairs of the wall lizards from the island where they lived and ate insects to another island that did not have those insects. And as a result, many years later, they came back and found out those descendants have adapted and become vegetarians. Other sciences depend on evolution, just to name a few, biochemistry, paleontology, genetics, anthropology, medical research, and more. And one of my favorite proofs about evolution is humans. We know that we have not always existed. Therefore, we started to exist at some point. The crazy thing is that everybody already believes in evolution. Creationists, like in, in uh, T-Jump's video, creationists have to accept that evolution exists. It's necessary to get from the kinds presented on Noah's Ark to the biological diversity we see today. The main complaint is the time scale, not the fact that it happens. Even science deniers have to admit that evolution can be and has been observed. Here's a few examples. Here's a mono uh, single cellular organism developing into a multicellular organism in a lab. The next one over is a um, E. coli bacteria that developed the ability to digest citrate. It, there's just, it's, there's so much in favor of it. It's crazy. So the challenge today is not to show the flaws in the model. Of course, there are flaws. There are always going to be anomalous pieces of data in any system. The challenge today is to demonstrate a better, more accurate model. And that is the end of that. Thank you very much for that opening statement. We are going to kick it over to the, you could say, skeptical side of evolution. But before we do, I want to mention, folks, if you have been living in a cave on Mars with your fingers and your ears and you didn't know about our upcoming in-person conference on Saturday, April 22nd, you can see this at the bottom right of your screen, DebateCon 3.1 is Modern Day Debate's own debate conference. It's going to be in Fort Worth, Texas. If you have not already... Check out the links in the description box. We've got a link for in-person tickets, as well as a link to watch all the debates live that day from home if you're too far from Fort Worth, Texas. You don't want to miss this conference. Life moves fast, folks. So you might want to take, around, or take a look around because this conference, you don't want to miss it. Go for it. Check out the links in the description. And with that, we're going to kick it over to our creation side. Thanks very much, Jen. And T-Rock, the floor is all yours. In your choice, whether you want to go first, you want me to. Uh, you go, take it up, take it away, T-Rock. Okay, I'm going to give a quick introduction for myself. Um, I represent the young Earth creation side, and yes, it's a globe. Um, I am not an evolution skeptic. I outright deny that it's a valid model altogether, um, so I'm not borderline anything. Um, the data is pretty clear to me, very clear. <clears throat> so, with that, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with the the nature of the fossil record, just because it happens to be um, 
some of the material that I had prepped and and it's pretty good. I, I don't think I'm going to share my screen or do a whole lot as far as that goes. I'm going to kind of talk my way through it a little bit. And if we want to look at some of the information, that's fine. Um, the fossil record. So that's one of the big uh, supporting arguments for evolution. Um, it's, it's a completely bogus um, argument to use it to support evolution. And the reason there, there are several reasons for that, but probably the most outstanding to me is there is zero um, apparent geological deep time in the in the fossil record like absolutely zero so sediments are laid down very rapidly by by um, water transport and uh, the vast majority of the fossil record is directly tied to some sort of um, water transport um, in between those occasionally you'll get something like igneous rock that comes through and of course radiometric dating applies to most igneous rock and um, no apparent geological time either there because everybody knows that volcano eruptions are by definition catastrophic and quick so you get an outpour of um, igneous material that sometimes gets interstitched between uh, sedimentary layers and you want to do a radiometric dating test on it of some sort. The problem is there are no such thing as uh, volcanoes that have um, um, volcanoes that people have witnessed to erupt that have accurate radiometric dates pinned to them none um so the the counter argument is typically something like well you have to use the correct dating method and young volcanoes don't fit in that and that's a, a very poor argument to say the, the the very best you can about it because um if a young uh, igneous formation does not reset the clock on radiometric um, uh, isotope ratios then there's basically no way to argue that older ones that nobody's seen somehow mysteriously had that ability. So um, so the absence of apparent geological time is a huge factor in looking at the uh, fossil record. Another really big, important factor to look at is that um, if, you, if you take an example like the coelacanth, um, I think the first coelacanth that was discovered was pinned with a date of something like 300 million years. Um, it was assumed for a very long time that coelacanth went extinct. Okay, fast forward, I don't know, a couple of decades, I think, but um, somebody discovered live coelacanth fish off the coast of Africa somewhere. What does that tell you? Absence from the fossil record is zero indication of extinction. It means absolutely nothing. So when you try to make um, predictions about extinction from the fossil record, it, it's, it's doomed to failure because eventually what happened was another coelacanth was found, and I believe it was pinned at a date of somewhere around 60 million years. So you had a 240 million year hiatus, and guess what? The one that was found at 60 million years was just as recognizable as the one that was dated to 300 million years, which was just as recognizable as the live version found off the coast of Africa. Um, in other words, extreme stasis is yet another problem for trying to predict um, extinction in the fossil record. So without the ability to predict extinction in the fossil record and combining that with the fact that uh, just about everything you find is fully formed and has, uh, and, and a lot of it has a very um, close or almost identical modern uh, counterpart to it, um, you can't use the fossil record to predict arrival either. So it fails on both points in a, in a very serious way. Um, on top of that, um, most of the time studies that you do, um, they, they all have some sort of interdependency built into them. And so people like to talk a lot about the, cal or, uh, about the uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the error bars. They're, they're, they, they like to talk about the error bars and how they pin you down to a pretty tight precision. Um, that's a fallacious argument just because it completely misrepresents how the science is actually done. Uh, those error bars are typically derived directly from statistical analysis of how accurate your direct measurements are. In the case of radiometric dating, that would be like a, um, let's say, a, um, <clears throat> a mass spectrometer counting of individual atoms. And so it's, it's a very accurate way to count atoms. So the precision is very high on it. 
the problem is there is a completely separate metric you have to do on the age assessment itself. And so one example I, I'd like to give is like in carbon-14 dating. You can measure atoms as accurately as you want to all day long, but once you get outside of observable human history, you have to have something to gauge its accuracy by. So if you go out and start counting atoms of carbon-14 in, um, in diamonds or coal or dinosaur soft tissue or something like that, you can find significant levels that are above the so-called background radiation or whatever. Um, and then you basically, you just say, okay, well, the atom count was wrong. The age is what really counts. And then so you, you reference a completely different system to basically correct the error bars in the age assessment itself. Um, so in a nutshell, those are some of my major um, arguments against the validity of of uh, evolution and how it approaches the science. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, relinquish there and let Jen take over. Thanks, T. Rock. Uh, I guess the first thing I need to do is share my screen to my PowerPoint. Is that working? Yep. So can they just see my PowerPoint? I can that crop it? it. No, it's all I good. Know. I just want no, no, it's all good. I just want to make sure. Hi, I'm Jen. Nice to see everyone. Thanks to everyone for joining the debate. I'm sort of hard to give a summary of why I feel like I'm in a good position to talk about this, but uh, I'm really into science and theology. I've been studying physics for uh, quite a long time, worked in signal processing for seven years and learned a lot about how information works and how systems evolve in general. So I'm not really here to debate against the premise of evolution, and I'm not really sure what creation means. I'm certainly not trying to say that uh, I'm taking a position against conservation laws, because I do like to think of myself as highly scientific, but uh, there's problems. I mean, clearly, if uh, you've had a look at what's out there in terms of what's being said, it's at the very least uh, leaves something to be desired. So I'm hoping to share my critiques with evolution as it's currently understood, as well as briefly show what a, an alternate model could look like that wasn't based almost entirely on fallacious presuppositions. So we'll get right into it. Assumption one, the idea that information travels along genes. Now that may seem so totally self-evident, but actually there's something that is causing the matter to have the structure that it does. And so the matter itself and its structure are always the effect, never the cause. And so whenever I see a theory where something is causing other things and it's a material cause i'm suspicious because i know that the only possible coherent model is mind first and that's really where we get into where i differ i'm not questioning the the record i'm just saying this model's not telling you what you think it does and in a lot of ways there's no way to verify because i'm sure the other interlocutors can validate that dna is not something you can really test Genetic information is not something you can really get your hands on in anything other than a statistical average for stuff dating back to the point that you'd need to date it back to actually be certain about evolution, to actually look at the theory and say, you know what, we're in an impossibility of the contrary situation here rather than this, which is frankly, I feel more confused when I look at this stuff than before. Before I had some basic, uh, you know, intuition about grass and flowers and things kind of making sense and structure and symmetry but then i read this evolution stuff and it just seems like linear presuppositional gibberish but anyway assumption two genetic genetic variation is terrible terrible that seems so right doesn't it but it's actually not how it works because the mind is the decider so where the actual first domino gets pushed is 
when you remember your parents based on shared traits and reincarnate into a fetus based on how similar you are. And that's not happening on the level of the genes. That's happening on the level of the soul. So even though you can say, well, there's tons of genetic similarities between people in the same family. Well, sure. But that's basically saying, well, I can't really say anything more about you. I can't differentiate you from your siblings. So this theory isn't really not nailing down a whole lot of precision. So is genetic variation heritable? Actually, not quite. I have darker eyes than both my parents. Oh, uh, well, well, we got to now invoke some magical thinking. What's that? Oh, it was a recessive trait. We can save the day. And then when everything isn't determined by genetics, guess how we save the day? Epigenetics. So just really invoking magical terms at every turn, that's telling me it sounds more like theological gibberish and not so much a scientific theory, which is a really simple model or structure that you can put some information in, get some information out that's different, that tells you something about something that hasn't happened yet, aka a prediction, just in case anyone forgot. And this is really the most problematic assumption, I think. The idea that mutation that is caused from random things is what is going to lead to these changes in animals and plants and living organisms. These <laughs> claims like this are completely unverifiable because a term like randomness is completely undefined. Assumption four. Natural selection acts on genetic variation present in a population favoring individuals with advantageous traits. More circular logic. We have fitness, therefore fitness. Scientific model would actually mean you were giving criteria defining fitness, specific criteria, specific enough criteria that you could go out and test it. Got about a minute left. Oh dear, I had so much more, but I got so excited, I guess. So we'll just skip ahead. You know, I'm sure we can get into it. No evidence whatsoever for this uh, mysterious RNA to DNA transition that is supposedly uh, part of the evolutionary theory uh, issues. It's, yeah, again, I think I mentioned it was imprecise. I want to get into this more because one of the other interlocutors mentioned uh, Brassica. So I think that is an important example to show how macroevolution cannot be anything in the same ballpark as microevolution because of the rate at which it happens. So I'll just skip that for now. And uh, yeah, I think I mentioned random mutation earlier. That's not a thing. So there is an alternate theory. You have to embrace a different type of uh, metaphysics, which are actually parsimonious. And then, you know, so there's a bit of a learning curve, so I won't go into it now, but I did have some other stuff to share, but I think I might just skip it because I, James told me I had a minute, what feels like a minute ago. So we'll just hopefully be able to explore some of these ideas in greater depth with the open conversation. Thanks again for having me. I'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much for that opening. And we are going to jump into the open dialogue. Just a couple of quick things in terms of formatting, folks. We will have Q&A following the open dialogue. So if you happen to have a question, you can tag me in the live chat by using at Modern Day Debate. Otherwise, Super Chats go to the top of the list and as I had mentioned earlier, we are thrilled about this conference coming up that you can see at the bottom right of your screen. One of the big debates there, if you didn't know about it, is going to be RN Raw and T Jump. It's going to be huge, folks. We're thrilled about it. You don't want to miss it. Check out the links in the description for the conference coming up in just eight days. It's coming quick, folks. With that, thank you very much, folks. The floor is all yours. And I'm just going to rearrange the pictures on screen. So in case name tags don't match up, folks, I will fix that. All right. Forgot to remind you guys, easy. if you guys turn off your camera, it'll scramble the pictures on me. But ready for you. Okay. Uh, Jen, I'll start with you because you just went. Um, you, you confused me a little bit here. You said that matter is never the cause, mind first. Are you implying that, like, 
flowers and grasses and whatnot have to decide to be flowers and grasses before they become flowers and grasses? Well, that implies a mind is a deciding agent and there's only one mind. So that's why it's a bit hard to understand where I'm coming from sometimes because I'm using parsimonious metaphysics that are top down. So one mind, we don't uh, assume it's possible to ever establish that there is even such a thing as one mind, but we consider it useful fiction. And therefore we say, yeah, we'll model it with one mind and then <sighs> do the modifications relative to that universal mind, which is what I had a diagram, but I didn't really get into it. The funny little plump mushroom sort of looking sort of apple thing. Oh, with the, the crispy tube in the middle. Okay. Yeah, I gotcha. So we're, we're you're going with a, a single mind, universal mind, something along those lines. And then every mind is like a fragment of that kind of thing. Matter is a fork of a, like a tuning fork that becomes attracted to the order of the mind. So it's, you can think of a, a simplistic metaphor as when you have those tiny little filings and they're put in a proximity of a magnet and they take on a structure. Okay. You know I, I, mean? I think I've How got the shape like of the it. Little, it How... there's, there's just the filings and then the magnet comes and then they whoosh, come up. It's kind of like that. The matter is being polarized or ordered by the mind. All righty. How... How does one verify a model like that? Like, how do you know that? Well, that kind of comes down to opening the door about a conversation about what is most important in science, because we're, we haven't really had that conversation yet. Like we're sort of saying, science has to be everything. You know, we got this crazy T-Jump intro video. It was like, blah, 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 blah. It's like maybe trying to be all things to all people or something, but we would have to, to have a conversation and say, you know what, the most important thing about science let's just say, is uh, the ability to make predictions. Sure. And and can this universal mind model make predictions that we can test? Yeah, but then it's a description. And so there's a question about differentiating a description from a prediction. And so the predictions would be things like aggregate on the aggregate scale the thermodynamic efficiency will always increase okay well i'm i'm gonna stew on that for a minute um t-rock i want to bring you in here um i i understand you are not a fan of deep time which is why i tailored my presentation specifically to deal with stuff we can observe in the present um but why, with the coelacanth, were you suggesting that it went extinct and then was recreated or something along those lines? Uh, no, that's, that's quite the opposite of what I said. What I said was <clears throat> fossils appear suddenly, quote unquote, suddenly. They're just there. Uh, and the coelacanth is, it, it's a it's a good example because when you, when you see the, the very um, first so-called um, so-called first coelacanth, it's quite a, easily identifiable as a fish. It's just a fish. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's a scaled fish at that. So uh, scales fully formed, fins fully formed. It's a fish. Nobody's going to mistake it for something else. Um, so there it is, fully formed. First time you see it, 300 million alleged years ago. And um, and then basically you have this, this uh, hiatus in the fossil record for the evolutionary estimated time of about um, 240 million years. Um, that's where the 60 million year line comes from. Now, the deal though is that 60 million year discovery didn't come for decades after the original. What came before that 60 million year discovery was the live version. So when people saw it, they were like, wait a minute, this was extinct uh, 300 million years ago. And quite obviously it wasn't. So what you have an example of is extreme stasis. Um, and, and that's just one of many examples. My, my slides here, if, if you want me to show them I, um, real quick, James, I'm going to tear my screen because Wait, we I didn't we, really do this don't. earlier. We don't need them. We're the fine. No. Okay. So 
Uh, just some quick examples here uh, of what stasis looks like. So here's three or four examples right here. Um, take a look at the leaf, living and fossil from some alleged 20 million years ago. In my world, I used to do tree trimming and I still do some, uh, did some this week actually. Uh, that's a maple leaf. And um, this is called, it's called liquid amber, but it's basically just a maple leaf. Um, is it a different species from what I'm used to? Probably, but irrelevant because it's easily recognizable as a maple leaf. Um, so so anyway, in response to your, your question, Amber, um, no, I'm not saying they disappeared, got recreated and reappeared again. I'm saying there there is zero deep geological time evident between the one that's supposed to be 300 million years old and the ones that live today. What makes much more sense is they never went extinct in the first place. They didn't evolve in the first place. They started out as coelacanths and they're still coelacanths. Okay, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, we've got a, a, there's a few different examples of creatures who haven't significantly evolved over long periods of time, like crocodiles and alligators. How about um, these? Turtles, shrimp, more fish, amber. Sure. There's However, there's also spiders. I think, I think T-Jump's video showed a, um, Oh, I, I don't remember what it was, but there's spiders, insects, worms, snakes, you name it. Yeah, all kinds of things. Earthworms have been largely unchanged for millions of years as well. There are certain optimal configurations, as we've seen with modern living creatures uh, experiencing convergent evolution. Like the shape of a wing, the function of a wing is virtually the same from critter to critter to critter you've got different variations on the design like a dragonfly has four wings instead of just two but the aerodynamics are the aerodynamics so wings develop into wings um also it's worth noting that we don't yet have every fossil like the earth is huge we have a percentage of fossils we don't even have enough fossils to tell what percentage of fossils we have so just because we haven't found a coelacanth within that large window of time doesn't mean there isn't one it's sort of a black swan kind of thing if you see what i mean well that's what i was saying you can't predict extinction by the fossil record but you can't does that. predict arrival either. Nobody does that. It's not a thing. It's not like we can predict. No, no one's trying to predict extinctions by the fossil record. That's not a thing. Um, so I don't know why you think that's significant. Like, obviously. I, I'll, I'll give you a real quick rundown of why. I, I, and, and maybe the word predict isn't technically the correct thing. But but essentially, that's what they're trying. They're, it's a post-diction really. But um, the reason I say that is because the classic is the KT boundary with the um, so-called iridium boundary where dinosaurs went extinct specifically because of that event. Um, but it's dinosaurs the same basic problems extinct. with the silicon. Dinosaurs didn't go extinct. Nobody's predicting all dinosaurs went extinct. Birds are dinosaurs. Crocodiles are dinosaurs. Sharks are dinosaurs. Um, there's lots of things that are dinosaurs that still exist. No one's trying to predict things going extinct by the fossil records it's not a thing that science does obviously if you have a fossil of one thing it could still exist today there could be a t-rex hiding in some kind of forest that we just haven't discovered yet that's possible right no one cares foot. it's not it's irrelevant to evolution it's irrelevant what is relevant is the ability to make predictions about the future of things that we actually are trying to predict like evr patterns in dna like double hinged jaw joints that we're going to find a transition between a lizard and a mammal like a tiktaholic a transition between a fish and a lizard uh, archaeopteryx from dinosaurs to birds these are predictions we've made that have been correct these are real evidence so you guys have a hypothesis a nice thing that makes you feel good in your imagination um, predictions are for things that haven't happened yet not descriptions of things that have already happened so jen if i predict i'm going to find a gold brick in my backyard that's a prediction and if i find a gold brick that is a confirmed prediction so if i predict we're going to find a double hinged jaw joint uh evolution between um uh, right but let's lizard. go a little wait, further wait, back wait, from wait, that wait, and wait, look at the assumptions wait, yeah wait, but we're wait, still wait, at the part wait, of understanding the hold assumptions up, jen, let me finish jen, i don't jen, disagree with you on jen, the other you don't me, need to explain to me the same jen. thing for the 50th time let's just let's give tom a i want to know how you can justify your presumption go ahead tell me your presumption laden stuff Tom. i do have to give tom a chance to finish and then i promise to come over to you so the ability to predict things we don't know yet, like a double hinged jaw joint, 
transition between lizards and mammals and getting it right before we knew it, that's evidence. That's real evidence. You guys don't have any evidence. You have an imaginary story that makes you feel good. But what we need is some way to differentiate which of these hypotheses is better. And the way to do that is the one that can make the correct predictions the most. Evolution makes tens of thousands of these. Now, Jen wants to bring up about your assumptions. How, assumptions are irrelevant. You can make any assumptions. Well, I was trying want. to tell you that predictions are about the future, Tom. So if yes. evolution was actually a model, it would tell us what we were going to evolve into. No. Not, oh, well, okay, I'm going to go and find some stuff and just put it in my tree diagram, and then it's going to make sense. So the issue is, what's the basis for the assumption that the way things look is dictated by their genetics? Well, those seem like two different questions. First is no, evolution does not need to predict what we're going to evolve into. Uh, evolution says that we're going to evolve into what is that? If it were is a the theory, shush, Tom, shush, it shush, would be predict shush, predicting shush, the future. Shush. Let's give Tom another 30 seconds, then we'll come over to you, Jack. <laughs> so no, you do not need to predict what we're going to evolve into. Evolution is saying we will evolve into things that are more conducive to the environment, whatever the environment is. Do we know what the environment is going to be? No, because environments change based off of geology and other things. So no, you don't need to predict what we're going to be. Predictions apply to any unknown facts about the universe, can you predict that those will be known prior to us actually discovering them? It applies to anything. In the past, too, you don't need to predict what we're going to evolve into. Literally irrelevant. So geology is not a science either, I guess? It is. It but is seriously, I just want to know where you get the assumption that the way a species looks has anything to do with its genetics. Well, that's, that's not an assumption. That's literally like... It is an assumption, I'm afraid, of evolutionary theory. No, we can literally change the genetics and then watch the species form and it has a different shape. This is your same argument as we can cut out someone's brain and therefore consciousness comes from the brain. Well, well that's... It's the same argument as that it doesn't actually justify the... It's just You're just circularly reasserting your presumption. It's I'm, I'm asking, forgive me, if you're going to use an axiom... Causation. If In my system, if you're going to make something an axiom, it has to actually be empirically verifiable like any time you want. It's got to be so obvious as to be borderline self-evident if there can be such a thing. And this does not really seem that way because it doesn't, it can actually, you know, be falsified. Um, Let me, let me say something real quick about this whole prediction conversation. I've got a slightly different perspective than Jen does, but I I definitely appreciate what she's saying because um, she's absolutely correct. And you're not predicting anything. What you're doing is using inductive or deductive reasoning to basically follow a pattern. That's, that's what you're doing. Okay. But, but here's the deal. If when you, when you start citing um, prediction as the, the thing that validates your model, evolution falls really really flat on this and the reason i say that is because um when you're going to make a a a quote unquote prediction in in the colloquial sense if you're going to make a prediction based on your model you and and say that it distinguishes your model above another one you have to use the principles that are exclusive to your model no, you, don't. you cannot use the overlap area and so you know citing things like you have no evidence there's huge evidence. Um, you, you have to micromanage your definition of ed- evidence to say otherwise. There's a giant fossil record out there buried in wait, marine wait, wait. Go back to the first transport. thing you said. Go back to the first thing you said, that you need to make <laughs> predictions that are specific to your model. That's wrong. Like, no, that's completely wrong. Like, no one is. You literally can't do that's that. That's not what I said. Wait. That's not what I said. What did you say? What I said was, if you want your model to bear the status of standing above another model, you have to get out of the overlap zone and you have to use the principles that are exclusive to your Yeah, model. that's wrong. That just shows you don't understand science or philosophy. No, that you literally, shows you don't understand no, 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 no. the difference stop, stop, between... Stop, stop, stop. One second, one second. Let no, me, let me you give stop the for a second. You talked for actually, quite a while, a little while ago. I give the argument. <laughs> so you don't understand basic philosophy here. It's called the problem of underdetermination. There is no ever being able to get over to, a, to like exclusive facts that are only in your model. There's always infinitely many empirically equivalent theories that can explain all the data no matter what we could all have been created by leprechauns farting out the universe five seconds ago and that could create all of the evidence we see in front of us so the fact that you want to have some exclusionary fact that only works for one hypothesis is just an ignorance of basic philosophy you can't do that doesn't matter no one wants that what we want is the ability to take whatever your hypothesis is no matter how ridiculous and use it to predict things we don't know yet and get it right that's evidence it doesn't matter if it's exclusionary because you can't get that you literally can't get that okay so 
you might have that as your backdrop philosophy. It's what? not mine. It's not logical and it's logically inconsistent. And what? I'll go a, a big step further and say it's actually self-defeating. If there are infinite, infinitely number of viable hypotheses, <laughs> then all you're saying is nobody can be right and we can't really know. Um, that is just, it's, it's, obviously self-defeating wait, wait. so, so um, tell me tell me about the leprechaun so leprechauns could have farted out the universe five seconds ago and made everything how it looks today why would that not explain all the data because that is pure fantasy you don't need to invoke leprechauns it's about necessary conditions not whatever whoa, whoa, whoa. crap this, i can this think is of a specific question why would if suppose there are magical leprechauns they farted out the universe five seconds ago to exactly the way it looks to us today including our brain states with all of our memories and all of the empirical data we see why would that not explain all of the data everything we see literally everything because it has a positive formation energy that doesn't make sense, Jen. How much energy would it take to make farting leprechauns big enough to make the universe? I don't know. Take a lot of energy. The universe minimizes energy. Your argument is invalid. No, it's not. Invalid isn't. Arguments can't be invalid, Jen, in that sense. Invalid means the, per, the conclusion doesn't follow from it's premises. It's called a joke, T-Jump. But let's so, move on. So, no, no, I really I know, know let's, about, let's not move given on. Given the problem let's of underdetermination. Let's not move on. So T-Rock made a claim that... You need predictions that are exclusionary to your hypothesis, which is just dumb. Like, you literally can't do that. And I gave you a proof to why you can't do that. Here is a ridiculous hypothesis I came up with. One of the infinitely many that there are. Leprechauns farted out the universe five seconds ago with all the data we see. This Actually, is just an easy you literally proof. can. What? And it, and it has happened. Can what? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, if you have a model with exclusive information, we would be excited to hear about it. Well, I, Okay. I, I, I want to I, I, let's go to that in a second, but let's say whatever your predictions are, I can say leprechauns farted out the universe with that fact, and it wouldn't be exclusionary to yours. And then I can say, show me your peer reviewed paper since that's your standard. <laughs> what does that have to do with your original claim that you need predictions exclusionary to your model? That's just, I just proved that claim false. You don't need that. No, you didn't. You yeah. dreamt up a fantasy story and said it proved the claim false. Okay. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate in real time how the, the difference in actual predictions play out between evolution and and um the the young earth creation model um one of one of the uh popular predictions is for example um uh tiktolic right tiktolic yeah tiktolic somebody said oh look we can predict there should be a fossil with this general morphology found in in this layer of rock strata blah 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 okay and you called that a successful prediction of evolution and you said creation has no evidence and cannot make predictions wait what which is complete baloney so what actually happens with tiktolic is you're in the overlap zone any farmer knows that there are animals all over the planet that live in the water on the land in the mud in between the water and the land underneath the rocks next to the mud all over the planet there are forms that have uh, mechanical um, uh, locomotion ability to to transit these these areas so if i'm going to look for something that looks like a salamander i'm going to go to the mud to find it i don't need a backdrop of any origin story i can just look at modern biology and kind of figure that out so more of the overlap zone that exists between evolution and uh, creation is that there is a general sense to the creationist as well as the evolutionist that most of what you see in the fossil record tends to fall in these patterns of ecological zonation um, and and hence the quote unquote successful prediction of tiktolic so now the, again you don't need a backdrop in origins at all you just need to go look at some modern biology and figure out what environments possess which types of uh, morphology well, well, i want to use that and as you example. can do that so, so let's use tiktok as an example uh tiktok is in the overlap zone of the magical farting leprechauns because the magical farting leprechauns could have farted out a, a fossil that looks like tiktok in their universe so you didn't provide any predictions that are in the overlap zone of between creationism and magic farting leprechauns so 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 you haven't provided any unique predictions at all uh so so i don't know why you think this is relevant anybody what you're doing is exactly what i did with the leprechaun farting leprechaun hypothesis you take a fact that we discover that somebody else predicted and you say well i can explain that into my worldview this is called post hoc rationalization 
So you can take any fact you want and fit it into your already preconceived worldview. And anybody can do this because we have these things called imagination. Now, we don't really care about that. And science doesn't care about that. It's, it's fine that you can post hoc rationalize anything facts you want into your worldview. It's not evidence of anything. There is no overlap zone. There, everything is an overlap zone. And so it's not a relevant argument. What we need is, can you predict it before we know it? And guess who did that? Evolutionists. Evolutionists. So if it. everything's an overlap, then basically what you said is creation does have evidence. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. You literally, in one no. sentence, said that creation has no evidence, and then you said everything's in the overlap zone. No, no, no. So, so let, me, let, me, let me try to help you out here. So, yes, everything is in the overlap zone, which means any hypothesis can post hoc rationalize any data we have. Does that mean that data is evidence of any hypothesis? No, because the evidence is the ability to predict things before we know them and get it right. So the only thing that counts okay. is Okay, Tom. Wait. Um, thank you for the help, but I don't need it. Let me, let me use... Uh, and, and to be honest with you, I was hoping for people who wanted to talk about the actual science, not some bogus philosophical view of the science. I, I wanted to talk about science, the actual biology, the geophysics, the chemistry, whatever. You well, guys you don't, don't want to talk about evidence. that. That's you want to talk maybe about maybe we the could go into like about... whether whether Tom or Ember think that the uh, fact that there's you know, no model for abiogenesis is an issue. There, there are lots of models. I don't know why that would be an issue, but I do want to. And they don't say where and the cell comes from. Genesis is irrelevant to evolution. It's true. Well, that's a claim that I can't see how it could be possible possibly be justified. So, do you not see any issues with a claim well, like hold that? Hold on, real, real quick before we go down that. That's that's a, a pretty big shift, and and I don't mind that. But let me let me finish where I was going with the prediction real quick, and then we can shift gears. Um, I, I use the the TikTok as the example of the evolution successful evolutionary prediction in creation. Um, prediction, understanding that truly what Jen said is is true. We're, we're not telling the future. We're basically giving a descriptive um, um, a, a rendition of what we should find. And so in that sense, it's not technically a prediction, uh, as Jen said, but but it's the not a working example for prediction. <clears throat> the working example for creation is where Dr. Rus Russell Humphreys basically here on Earth um, before satellite missions got sent out into deep space, um, put together a mathematical physics model based on standard physics. And he said, okay, um, it looks to me like the planets were formed from bodies of water. And so what he did was he, again, very standard physics, um, uh, water molecules possess, or hydrogen molecules, I, I think is more specific, but they possess a very super weak magnetic field. And if they're aligned perfectly, you get a strong magnetic field. And when you flip them all of a sudden and, and disorient them, you can induce a magnetic field into something else. So anyway, he, he basically took the mass of the earth as water, as I understand it, and used that to use standard physics calculations to say, okay, the planet uh, Uranus should have xyz level of magnetic field strength today and um fat now he he put a model together you can go find this on the internet uh, quite easily i think but go um fast forward a, a decade or so later a shuttle actually got sent out into deep space like that and uh lo and behold they measured the the um they measured the magnetic field strength of Uranus and some other bodies. And uh, Dr. Russell Humphrey's um, model was based on specifically a 6,000 year timeline um, using standard physics. So when they got out there and they measured it, he was off by, I think he says a factor of three, but the same evolutionary deep time model was off literally by about six orders of magnitude. And and again, time is the relevant factor there. So oh, okay. the, that, and that is the dude. He, and that is the exclusionary principle between that separates the difference between evolution and creation. Deep what, time is, is one of those exclusionary principles. Uh, actually, no. So, so like magical farting leprechauns could fully explain that as well. So it's not exclusionary. Um, <laughs> you, you don't understand philosophy. But I do want to mention a couple things here. One, Robert Humphreys was wrong. We know he's wrong because we can use his calculations to calculate the magnetic field of all different bodies. And he only got one right. The rest of them are all wrong, which is called luck. Uh, you Sorry, luckily, correct, right. exactly incorrect misinformation. No, that's exactly correct. Like if we try he to applied use the same, equation, he applied the same model to several planetary model, uh, and bodies all and they're they were we, all we can, we can way take... closer than the evolutionary predictions that they should be. Evolution no, doesn't predict geophysics and astronom astronomical also, bodies. 
Uh, wrong again. Sorry, what? that's that's just really? completely inconsistent what? with the literature. Evolution has to do with biology. It has, it has nothing to say about the magnetic field strength of freaking Jupiter. Okay, but you have to have the deep time for your evolutionary story to work. Well, actually, you don't. That's completely irrelevant. Like, we know that's a factor in reality. Deep time is a thing. Do you need that logically? No, you don't. This is an irrelevant thing. Hey, to Tom, up. I've got a question. How old is civilization? Uh, I don't know. 50,000 years. Oh, okay. So not 6,000 years. No, that was definitely, definitely not. not. So have... someone, if they thought that, they'd probably be on par with a young Earth creationist yes. in terms of their logic then? Oh, they'd cool. Probably Just literally, literally be one, yes. <laughs> Like, yeah, I don't know we, if we want to go into the abiogenesis thing or if people want to like maybe concede that I have a point that what? it might be problematic that there's no model for abiogenesis. There is a model. What are you talking about? Like even if there wasn't a model, that wouldn't be problematic. It'd just be an argument from ignorance fallacy, but there is a model. So two things. One, it wouldn't matter if there's no model. Two, it, it, we have a model. Which is? Uh, RNA world hypothesis. Okay. And did you know that they've tried to replicate RNA-based life and they've failed every time? It's, no, no one's tried to do that. So no one is trying to create... Well, they certainly have. But you can come up with a model and not try and test it and it's still a it, valid model. Yeah, they, sure. it would be irrelevant even if that were true because humans' ability to replicate something doesn't make it true or false. But verification, you'd agree, is part of the scientific method yeah, it literally if, if sounds to me it, like you both just said that evolution is unfalsifiable no <laughs> not, not from a totally unrelated question that hasn't even been seriously investigated if we investigate something that is related to evolution and it comes up wanting then yes there would necessarily have to be some changes made but from where we sit right now we really need an entirely different model to come in and do head-to-head -head combat with evolution and do a better job of describing reality. And so far, I'm not seeing one. I'm just seeing a couple nitpicks about the, the magnetic field strength of Uranus and uh -huh. the, the lack of proof for abiogenesis. Well, so I did want to address the, the stuff a little bit. So... Uh, what, whether we humans, as Amber said, have been able to reproduce the entire sequence of events from RNA to life is irrelevant. It makes no difference whether or not we can do the entire series of events. There's about 100,000 steps to go from RNA on clay forming corpuscles to get any kind of cellular reproductive self-organizing life. No, we don't have that. You're right. We haven't done that. Do we need that? No. Have we made predictions? We don't need the model to make verifiable predictions? You don't need to predict literally every single step from beginning to end of the model to be able to have a confirmed model. No. All you need is to pre accurately predict certain steps. If you can predict some of the steps and get it right, that's evidence of your model. If a different person... So how do we know how, when the model is acceptable if we don't need to get it 100% right? If it accurately predicts the future a significant number of times, that's, that's good. That's all you need. And the more times it predicts it, the more reliable it hey. is. Real quick, can I ask Jen, um, what is your education level, if, if you don't mind? I have a honors degree in physics, math. Okay, I, I'm just I'm just curious because I personally I don't have any any um, academic achievements anybody's going to care about. Um, I, I just heard you saying that you worked in um, you know uh, in physics basically, right? <laughs> so um, just give you a quick background. It was more for in me. technology. Sure. Not quite, it's not applied physics, yeah, more with okay. computers, but go ahead. Okay, fair enough. Um, but you're used to handling a lot of mathematical models, I would assume. No. Yeah, I, I had to I'm come up with no some. On that one. I'm going to vote no. I vote no. Onions, <laughs> no. The mind onion, no. Um, yeah. But no, the, the only reason I ask is because my my educational and career background is is along the lines of mechanical engineering and manufacturing. So, um, I, I, I it's not the same as what you do. I may not have the accolades that you do academically, um, but but I do an application version of what I do. And mathematical models is a big part of engineering. So, um, whenever I look at um, evolutionary mathematical models, they're a joke because you can't use that type of logic in the real world 
to actually build buildings and bridges and cars and stuff like that. But no, <laughs> we're, we're not relevant. bridges with evolution. That's I, it would be really cool if we could grow a bridge or something. That would that would be no, that, and it, no, that, you, you're missing my point. You, you want to talk evolution as in biology? That's fine. We can do that because that's the whole deal is evolution on trial, and I know that means biological evolution. That's fine, um, but it also relies heavily on mathematical models and and uh, no, it and doesn't. Very um, like Darwin sorry. did zero math. Darwin it did zero math. And he was right. He was right in all of his book. He did no math. There was no mathematical so, equations in in the origin of species. Didn't happen. Okay. You don't so need math. You can just. So so far, what I've heard is you don't have to have um you don't have to test your hypotheses. Well, you, know, you don't have to do, have a mathematical have model. You, you can just look at the evidence, make a deduction, and say you're right. No prediction. If you can make novel predictions and be right before we know them, that's the standard that we need to show that you are correct. Uh, mathematical models don't matter. They're right. There are mathematical models in evolution. They're all right. And we can use them to build bridges. Actually, they're literally, that's been done, but, uh, you don't need to like, none of that's relevant. You're bringing up these irrelevant criticisms that are just outside of your ability to comprehend things and saying, you can't comprehend well, this really complicated that thing, therefore it. it's false. Like it's one possible prediction could be that fitness is going to increase over time. And then I'm going to put it to you and say like, well, how do we define that? It doesn't have to be a perfect definition. Just even a partial definition that we can actually test. It's got to be specific enough to test Wait, are you saying that's to the exclusion of, of other interpretations. Are you well, saying how like... about antibiotic resistant bacteria? We predicted that if we continue to misuse antibiotics, that bacteria would develop resistance to it. And lo and behold, here we are in a world full of antibiotic resistant bacteria. This they is, this... gained fitness and became sure. more immune to our that's a, that that's doesn't a great... lend... Go ahead, sorry. Uh, sorry, I, 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 it's it's a great point you bring up, Ember. But here's the huge glaring problem with it. So you predict antibiotic uh, resistance in bacteria, but in my line of work, we do a lot of um, root cause analysis, and in root cause analysis, you're literally um, um, advised to ask like eleven questions deep to to sort out why are the bacteria and uh, resistant to any antibiotics and as it turns out what's really happening is um, in, in some cases anyway the bacteria has the ability to absorb the um, the antibiotic drug that you give them and there's always a small percentage that that absorption method that the the bacteria uses is is basically dysfunctional and can't absorb the antibiotic and, and into its into its um, interior uh, inside the cell wall. So, do they become antibiotic resistant? Sure, but all you did was killed off the ones that could absorb it and left behind only the ones that were already broken and couldn't. Congratulations, that's fitness. You just proved evolution. Yeah, that. Whether just, it's natural selection I just or describe genetic selection. entropy and de-evolution. Can I just say something down. real quick? The antibiotic resistance doesn't actually establish that because, like, with the example that T. Rock gave, if you kill a hundred percent, you have a hundred, you know, organisms. You kill ninety-nine percent of them. Sorry, I said that wrong. But let's say you kill ninety-nine percent of what you have on your hands from the hand wash, and you get one percent left. That eventually reproduces to cover your hand again with a hundred percent of what was originally there meaning it's more resistant because it wasn't killed in the first shot. That didn't actually tri trigger any evolution. That, that, yes, there's no did. change there. there. Is the only selection. thing that's changed is the distribution of the things that were already there in the first place. So exactly. I'll agree. I mean, that's totally uh, perfectly fine logic and it makes total sense, but you haven't established any link to genetics or that actually any changes happen with regards to the you describe the change. Blocks. It's resistant. That is a change. It is a change in the heritable characteristics of that population. Yeah, but the population had that trait before the 99% were killed. Gen the population, 1% didn't population die means the majority. because they happened to not die because they were resistant to it intrinsically. They didn't gain a resistance by putting the uh, cream on your hands that's antibacterial. Well, to, so, yeah. And go ahead. Sorry, to, to, to put a finer point on it, um, what's actually happening is there is a serious loss of fitness in the uh, resistant bacteria because um, this has been done before. If you turn them back into the wild, so to speak, they can't survive. They needed what the original population had that you killed in the wild. 
they only survive when you coddle them in a petri dish and give them the antibiotic that killed all the healthy ones. No, it's done. So no increase in fitness, a serious decrease in fitness, and it, nothing no, that suggests it's, an increase it's in going fitness to for it's that going, the populations are going to continue to evolve into the next great thing. Well, literally, you're just denying reality because we've done this experiment. Like uh, Imber mentioned the experiment where uh, I forget what it was. The bacteria had developed the ability to produce to process cist citrate. That uh, new hmm. ability is a developed thing where the entire other population died because they didn't have any food. And they didn't require them. It did, they, they no longer needed this other population that had these other magical deteriorating things that they lost. All bullshit. Didn't happen. It worked just Sorry. fine. Factually wrong again. No, I just Sorry. proved I just proved you wrong. So in the no, you, didn't. Dish, you just made a, a random bunch of statements that weren't no, no. true. <laughs> so, so there's a petri dish. You add citrus, which is a food source. You take away the other food source. They're going to starve to death. The ones that can't process this rate starve to death and die. The ones that can survive. And they thrive, continue to grow just fine and they don't and all that other stuff you said about the older population you need those traits to survive all bullshit they didn't need it at all so it's just wrong you haven't established any genetic drift you've just established a drift in the distribution of the population so i'm trying, trying to totally entice you true. to go a little further and question the assumption that what is motivating the change is so I'll, I'll tell material. you what actually what actually happened with those populations is they did have the ability to digest uh, uh, citrates, but they don't normally do it. So they have a regulatory gene that allows it to switch back and forth. It is normally switched off. Nevertheless, there's always a remnant in the population that have it switched on. And so by feeding it the citrate, the citrate, you, you kill off the ones that have it switched off and leave only the ones that had it switched on in the first place. They already had the ability to digest the citrate before you conducted the experiment. And, there, no, and there all are you novels, did was killed off novels. the ones that, no, that's right. uh, and, and again, it's it's the same thing. The fitness decreases because as soon as you um, no, return them back to a wild state, um, they're not nearly as uh, fit anymore. Well, mm, it's it's wrong. it's a trade-off, T-Rock. Like, uh, for example, uh, sickle cell anemia. It, it is a decrease in fitness in most circumstances, but people with sickle cell anemia also have a hugely heightened resistance to malaria. So if you're in a malaria-rich area, it's actually a huge fitness advantage. So fit, fitness is based on the environment. So if you have an environment and a specific organism is fit for that environment and you put it into a different environment, obviously it's going to be less fit for a different environment. But guess what? That's not relevant. Literally irrelevant. Fitness is, does an organism function in an environment better than a different environment? So there's no trade-off. There's no like more or less fit. It's all bullshit. It's based on its ability to survive in an environment. And so if you make it able to survive in one environment, like uh, an environment with citrate and not other food sources, obviously, if you put it into a different environment with different food sources, it's not fit for that environment. Literally, just basic understanding of fitness here. Come on, come on, T Rock, come on. Just want to clarify something. There's a lot of people in the audience saying, well, that is evolution, Jen. No, that's artificial selection. Okay, you take some of that antibacterial stuff, put it on your hands, that you are artificially selecting against, you know, 99% of the bacteria on your hands, which then presumably might come back, you know, to haunt you down the line. But uh, that's not evolution, that's artificial selection. So another problem I wanted to bring up is that Artificial selection, like it's also brassica evolution. stuff. It's also evolution. It happens at a really fast rate. Like we can actually observe it happening, you know, through agriculture and stuff. Whereas if you look at mm -hmm. the time span, the age of the planet, like I'm not a young earth creationist. I accept the uh, radioactive or radiometric data on the age of the planet. And they're just, that hasn't been that rate of change in the species, you know, Artificial selection happens very quickly. So does natural selection. There are there are cases of natural selection where it happens just as quickly. Well, the fossil record might not agree due to something called punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium is literally it happening in fast increments. It's, 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 it's the graduation is the one that you're, you're thinking of. So yes, we it does happen very quickly in natural. Punctuated cases. equilibrium right. is it, it doesn't change for a long time, then boom, almost like a quantum very, state transition hint, and then it stays the same for a long time, and then boom, it changes yeah. again. That's punctuated equilibrium, and that's what the fossil record reflects. In some so cases, that, to me, that's very <laughs> different than something that we can witness happening. So it's to me, it's it couldn't possibly be the same process because 
the scale of time in which it happens is so di radically different. Jim, well, yeah, in and so in punctuated, it, one it, second, one second, in punctuated equilibrium, the changes happen over a very short period of time. Like there's no change for a long time, and then there's a lot of change very quickly that you can see happen. Um, so punctuated equilibrium would be an example of like artificial selection for a single population or something. Those would be equivalently fast. Like your argument is yeah. So there, there's a point. huge equivocation fallacy there because um, um, the the examples you guys give of what you call evolution, again, you're living in the overlap zone and you're you're describing <laughs> um, something deteriorating, and um, there is nothing about that that suggests the scale is going to turn into a feather. There's nothing about that that suggests the bellows lung of a reptile is going to turn into an avian lung of a bird. Not one single shred of that indicates that. All the predictions indicate that we can predict things in the future you can't our ability to predict things in the future and get it right is evidence of our entire hypothesis all of those things so your inability to predict anything and you can only post hoc things we've discovered and try and fit it into your worldview is evidence your worldview is garbage and ours is right only the only the hypothesis that can predict the future before we know it and get it right is the one that is justified so you want another theory. creation another very successful creation uh, prediction that was based on another a six thousand year timeline well you haven't given one like the, i've debunked the one you gave before the uh, yeah. why by saying, saying it was lucky that's not prediction. a debunk no no, no it's debunked because we can use class. his we can use his model to calculate the predicted electromagnetic strength of every single planet and it's wrong pretty much every single time it is wrong at an equivalent rate to that of or it's right at an equivalent rate to that of random chance um, you just this random number generated. is readily available on the internet yes, anybody can look it, it up and find out and that wrong. you are completely factually incorrect go ahead do it yourself go ahead do the electromagnetic calculations for any planet other than the ones he that he got right and you'll find he's wrong on all of them because guess what planets aren't made of water water doesn't equate to an electronic field his mechanisms are just wrong do you know what does accurately predict those geology geology and cosmology they accurately predict the magnetic fields of every single planet your guy doesn't it's false We've got just a few minutes before we go into the q a any concluding thoughts potato <laughs> uh, oh. i'm still waiting to hear anything resembling an alternative model or even a single prediction we'll jump into the q um, go ahead t rock sorry i was just gonna say you don't you don't you obviously don't accept predictions you just um you guys are just throwing um some denial out there and calling it a, a debunk um again go look on the internet dr russell humphreys i'm really familiar uh, with some, dr humphreys he here, here's it. two he's more he's wrong so, he's a so physicist a and prediction so the, the reason the, we're rejecting this like you, you brought up why we're rejecting the prediction that's true because predictions have to be specific and correct at a higher rate than chance like i can predict the lottery numbers and if i predict the lottery numbers for all time i get one of them right that's not a successful prediction that confirms my hypothesis that's a lucky guess uh, hinduism gave uh predicted that the age of the earth is 4.3 billion years old that's a really good accurate number but it was a lucky guess. All their other predictions are wrong. You can guess a lucky number correctly at a rate equivalent to chance, and that's not evidence of your hypothesis. You have to, to be able to predict things at a higher rate than chance. And guess what? Evolution does that. Tom, you ever you ever uh, produce your own mathematical model of anything? Yes. Program. Like what? I write uh, programs. I write programs. You write a program. Yes. Does it require intelligent input? Sure. Yes. Does it require your math to be correct? Uh, hopefully. Yeah, I'm I'm describing literally standard physics models using standard physics math, and you're just basically hand waving and saying it was a lucky guess. Everybody's wrong. Blah blah blah. Um, that's no, no, no. Not so so how a mathematical, mathematical model that gets or science either one work. So a mathematical model that gets 99% of the answers wrong and one right is a failed model. We don't accept those. So so you know, gets what so, you're missing. Here. Let me give you another quick example of where. Um, a successful mathematical model based on a very short time frame made a successful prediction in your in your um, in your terminology and that is where the um, helium um, retention in zircons was discovered via a prediction that they should be there based on six thousand years of elapsed time um, nobody thought they should be there 
all the models said no it can't be there blah 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 too much time's passed helium slips out uh, between the lattice structures of crystals too easily and lo and behold there was the predicted amount in those crystals based on a physics standard physics model with a six time constraint so i would need to know the methodology of why you think that the helium is in the zirconium and then i need to apply that to other physical mop to to other particles to see if the same uh mo model that we use to make this prediction is accurately describes the other things and guess what i would bet you a billion dollars right now it's going to get it wrong 99 percent of the time and get a lot and your guess. mathematical model that you just spewed is guaranteed to be incorrect well you, you know what t-rock i'm i'm not familiar with any of that stuff you just said but i am willing to concede it you win on that point because it makes absolutely no difference to evolution so evolution, the standard model of evolution doesn't require deep time. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> the standard model of evolution has absolutely nothing to do with finding heliums and zircons. But does it, the, the, the whole point is the time constraint that evolution has to operate in. Your, your prediction about helium and zircon does not prove there's no deep time. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Any closing thoughts, Jen? was an interesting debate and I appreciate having a chance to bring up my points and thanks everyone for being here, especially James host, as well as the audience members who had important contributions to make. <laughs> yeah. Th thank you, James. It's, it's, I, I know this one was really, really difficult to put together. We all appreciate you sticking with things audience. You should absolutely give James a like on this one because it was hard. Thank you for that support. Really do appreciate it. And we definitely appreciate your support, folks. So please do hit that like button if you haven't. In terms of quick housekeeping stuff, folks, if you did not know, Modern Day Debate is on podcast. You can find all of our guest links. So Jen's, T-Rocks, T-Jumps, and Ember's links, both in the description box here on YouTube. And if you're listening via podcast, as all of these debates end up on the podcast within 24 hours, so you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you name it. You can also find our guest links in the description box there. Just want to let you know that. And we're going to jump into it with these questions. We're going to move as fast as we can. If you guys can do me a favor, just so we can get through as many questions as possible for the audience, if you're able to keep the rebuttals to a minimum, that way we'll be able to get through as many questions as possible. Malavia says, congrats, T-Rock on demonstrating that you horribly misunderstood science. And Jen, you want to argue that the, quote, the mind is the decider and that the soul is real, yet you have a problem with presup. We'll give you each a chance to respond to that if you'd like. Am I going first or? Help sure. Yourself. Well, okay i'm not sure what to say to that exactly yeah sure a prop, a presuppositions are necessary perhaps to build a certain level of complexity or structure to an argument uh, does does not mean we always have to use the same ones or that we shouldn't uh, inquire as into the nature of the uh, presuppositions themselves in fact the most important thing in philosophy in my opinion so thanks for the question you got it. T-Rock, are you going to let him say that? <laughs> they can say whatever they want. T-Jump did a pretty good job of just throwing um, claims out there like that. And and uh, I'm I'm back where I was with T-Jump on this. You know, um, that that's much more of a philosophical argument and a, just an empty claim than it is. Show me the hard science. Um, not one single uh, evolutionist has shown me any hard science yet. What they've done is made some descriptive claims without a proper root cause uh, analysis and then said, oh, we don't have to have a ma mathematical model. Wow. What is science without <clears throat> your mathematical model? I've got a mathematical model on my Let's, screen right now so of um, magnetic field decay in the earth. So The problem is you don't understand why it's evidence. People need to explain to you the philosophy because that's the part where you're not understanding. So you understand why it's evidence. Right now, you just you're incapable. So of you're making it. Jen's point for you have to have an, a philosophical underpinning of your science before it's worth anything. Thank yes, you, Tim. Literally, or, or literally, Tim. literally, science is a offshoot of philosophy. Of course, you'd need philosophy to build science. Obviously, this one from Matthew Smicer. Am I saying it right, Matthew? Let me know. It says Jen fan. You got a fan out there, Jen? 
so such a bright future she has to wear shades says for ember and t jump do we or how do we understand and or test the direction of change adaptation in larger life forms direction so again fitness is just the ability to survive within an environment so as the environment changes uh the organism changes to the environment so there's the example of the lizards who had eyesight went into a black cave where there's no light and then they lost the ability to see because their eyes no longer did anything and so it's not about there's no direction to it it's just whatever happens to work best in the environment that's that's the direction and we see this all the time in different species who move into new environments and either gain or lose functions uh, in order to accommodate the new environment yeah it's harder to chart the change in larger species because of the longer lifespans longer gestational periods um with bacterian labs we have a fairly easy time we can you know churn out generations every day and then keep a running log which many labs do with larger life forms the best we can do is just keep an eye on them and keep a log and see what happens you got this one coming in from do appreciate it j3 loviator j3 womber says it's on now Thank you for your hype. Karen B says, we do not live on a model. Do not try to base reality on a model. I completely agree. A model is designed to help us understand, but we should never, ever confuse the model for the real world it's trying to describe. Of course, we should base reality off models. Models are literally our imagination trying to describe reality. And if they can accurately predict the future, that means the model most likely describes reality. Yes, that's what we do. Yeah, that's more, um, that's more that self-defeating um, philosophy that was um, exemplified early on in the in the initial presentations where, um, yeah, we, we don't want to marry ourselves to a model because it might change. In other words, right. we can't really know. We might be right today, but tomorrow we might prove ourselves wrong. That's self-defeating philosophy. It's not self-defeating. It's progress. Learn what the words mean. I yeah, screwed we, this we one up to. earlier. Jen, Matthew Smeiser <laughs> also wanted to hear your response to what Ember and Tom said regarding how we understand or treat the direction of change or adaptation in larger life forms if you can remember back to it what would your response be if you can't remember back to it just let me know and we'll give them a chance to give a quick summary of what they said well i think the question was about how evolution theory would answer that so i'm i'm kind of being skeptical towards evolution theory so i don't want to confuse anyone i mean if they're asking about my model, then there's a primordial mind and the matter accumulates over time, becoming more thermodynamically efficient in separating the mouth from the anus, technically. So the spine is what's going to be doing that gradually. So we would expect not necessarily a longer spine over time, but a greater degree of deviation. Okay, because the deviation from the primordial state is what gives you the it's like with a hook, I'm sorry, hook's law, whatever that is, sorry, a spring. It's like the more it's compressed, the more power comes back. So in order to accommodate corporeally all the additional thermodynamic efficiency that evolution definitely is the direction we're going towards in, or however you say that, uh, would be that there would be more pressure basically on the spine or spinal region over time and that, that pressure is pushing away from the natural configuration of undeviated mouth to anus separation which is as i said grows 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 over time so that would be a prediction of my model at least i don't know how the other people are doing um hopefully that uh, answers it sorry if that's unclear it's pressure juicy to Push say it down the least. On me. this one coming in from dingley bumbus says three cheers for james t jump and ember and jen Ember is new to me. T jump, James, Ember, and T rock. Sorry, T rock. T rock, are you there? I'm here. T rock is T jump's father. So that's why they're both T rock and T jump. I am jump. James's but father. <laughs> this one coming in from Matthew Smeicher says mind versus chemical process. Particle had to go from a non sentient molecule, molecule into something that decides it is hungry or wants to survive evolution explained this without invoking consciousness and then jen please follow up 
I'm sorry. Uh, is that a question? Oh, they just want to hear your response to Tom and Ember's initial answer to this question. Why do you think yeah, consciousness is fundamental? That's the question. The question is, why do I think consciousness is fundamental? Yeah, well, they're because... asking, they want to follow up from you, Jen. They're asking for both Ember and, and or Tom and or Tom. And then they want to hear your response to that, Jen. So they so have to go first. The, the question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. If, <laughs> they, they was a little convoluted. The question is, how do we get from a single molecule to something that wants to eat and survive? Roughly speaking, yeah, that's pretty good. And our answer is probably materialism, evolution, the, the matter combines to bring bury brains, brains have intentions, et cetera. And then Jen's position is, no, it's mind was first, right? That's your position, Jen. So how do you explain this process? Jen, thoughts? All right, well, I was going to share the screen and just show uh, my image from before. The onion tree? Well, I don't know if it's quite an onion, but uh, an apple mushroom there. So, uh, yeah, I'm really sorry. I, I need you to ask the question again. I'm just I'm confused. No problem. They're saying life came about from matter, and they you want me to respond to why that is nonsensical? The question is, is consciousness came from matter, which was not conscious in our worldview. Electrons not conscious. They come together, build uh bigger animals which then become conscious your version is the opposite of that right Why? yeah i okay because logically there's no way to tell any boundary between consciousness and non-consciousness and the easiest example of that is we assimilate non-living matter all the time so there's no easy way to tell between living and non-living and consciousness is not something you can draw a boundary between it and anything else and in my philosophy we try to minimize boundaries because we understand that boundaries cost energy and that energy is minimized so what you're looking at here is a boundary which is also not a boundary so it's like a superpositional boundary non-boundary and it represents the realm of possibility which is everything except three plus one simultaneous observations and so this shape the one number one is your undeviated mouth to uh, rectum, as I mentioned earlier, separation. And then you can see how this shape number two is like a simplified version of number one. And then from three th on is how that shape deviates from through evolution, matter accumulating in a body enables a deviation from the primordial mind, which then increases its efficiency, which you can approximate it as the amount of torque that is separating the mouth from the anus. Because if you look at something like a single cell, it doesn't have a mouth, it doesn't have an anus. So those two things are delocalized within its body. And so the force of life is a localization of a separation between a mouth and anus. So maybe there's a metaphor in there about you know getting your head out of your ass or so, I'm not sure, but thanks for listening. Hopefully that is, clears it up. I'm sorry it's hard to go into quickly. And uh, yeah, panpsychism for the win. Thank you for that. This one coming in from Hates Stairs says, T-Rock, how do you explain the heat problem with young Earth creationist perspective? Um, there is no heat problem. It's, um, and, and I will grant, I will, I will readily grant that um, in the creation circles, they consider a heat problem. Um, however, you, you you're asking my opinion um i i actually am very um, interested in geophysics and geophysical processes and so the reason functionally speaking the reason there is no heat problem is because the accelerated decay that was uh that was proposed through the discovery of uh, helium um in zircons that shouldn't be there in a in a deep time uh setting um so it was assumed by the creation model that that was the product of accelerated decay. Okay. Um, the reason there's no 
apparent heat problem anyway is because that rock that it was found in is associated directly with creation week not the flood week and during the creation of the earth it was formed in water and out of water you can't have a heat problem for an unspecified volume of water where there's no life forms on it yet um so there is no heat problem but more specifically my model um that, that does deviate from accelerated decay is that it could just as easily be quote unquote accelerated fusion and fusion is an energy consuming pro uh, process so what is apparent in the rock that was uh, in question here it's granite not rhyolite so it's only gone through a single uh, heating significant heating cycle but um where was i going with that um in that it's 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 it has only undergone one heat cycle and so um because it's associated with with creation um week specifically um oh accelerated cooling is also relevant uh, apparent in that exact same rock so you've got um radio halos from polonium and and some other signatures of of uh, supposed radioactive decay uh, nevertheless it, it absolutely demonstrates uh, some super fast cooling mechanism that's apparent there too because you can't capture um uh, polonium halos like that except the rock cools very quick and the reason is is because it'll anneal um the signature completely out of the rock if it stays hot for very long so no heat problem. It could be fusion instead of uh, decay. Matthew Smelser says perform genetic algorithms for work and require initial fitness as well as statistical probability input coefficients. It's, so I think they're saying they perform genetic algorithms for work and require initial fitness as well as statistical probability input coefficients still ends in a forced result. I don't know um, what that means. I'm not sure what they're trying to say there. But you got it. This one from Matthew Smelser says, did the unicorn Tiktaalik or the leprechaun part first and why rainbows? Great debate. James, more Jen, please. Jen, wow. <laughs> you're, you're a fan out there, Jen. Any thoughts on this rainbow question, Tom? We're going to hear a question mark. Next up, Jake Nelson says, it was more of a troll question, says, so a population has a mutation that makes them not die, that becomes the dominant phenotype. How is that not evolution? That's for Jen. Jen, are you with yeah, It's us? really hard because, like, can you repeat the question? I yes. thought you were addressing it as someone else. Or T Rock, if you want to. They had said so a population has a mutation that makes them not die. That becomes the dominant phenotype. This How is, this is, is about that the, not evolution? It's okay, about the hand okay. washing thing. Like if you put soap on your hands, there's a mutation in one of the bacteria that causes it to survive. It's it's about that question. Okay, so yeah, so how is that not evolution? Again, that's an equivocation fallacy on what you mean by evolution. Um, no creationist um, argues the fact that things change. Most biological entities are a super high percentage of, of water or liquid of some sort. And so liquid by its very nature is constantly moving and has to change. Um, the it, it's not it's not textbook. Um, evolution because it does zero to establish that fails uh, feathers uh, come from scales or you, you know I, I mean name your name your morphological feature that you think was derived from something else it does nothing to establish any of that it's basically an example of genetic entropy um and and genetic entropy um is is usually discussed almost exclusively in biological terms but it's an actual uh quantitative uh study of molecular um disassociation um and biological units are not immune to that and this one coming in false. from we appreciate it bitter truth says to the creationists why their why are their birth defects your is is your is this because you're punishing infants do you 
do you creation does your creation model like evolution does well, let's go with the first part well, why are there birth defects on creationist perspective yeah because matter is imperfect matter is just an appearance of the mind so it's a, an approximation or simulation so it's going to be imperfections and there's also a evolution competition so when bad things happen to one animal or one life form maybe good things happen to another so it's you not it. to be understood as a punishment because that would imply some type of an intention operating on the universal level and that is something that's premise we negate thanks for the question so the the creation perspective on that real quick is that um that is very much a theological question not a science question why is there death and suffering in the world if it was created and designed to be very good it's a theological question if you can't handle the the, the raw science itself um, you can't handle the theology at all. Most most um, evolutionists or, or Bible critics can't even get the basic details of the flood account correct. And it's like three chapters at most, a super quick, easy reading, and they still can't get that correct. So they're not going to get the theology correct. But there's death and suffering in the world because um, it started out as a very good world. People did something wrong, and the consequence is that things fall apart when you do something wrong. Don't believe me? Go set up a lab experiment in a purely secular environment and do your experiment wrong and see what falls apart with it. All according to plan, by the way. The uh, the perfect plan from the perfect being. Who drowned babies. So you guys are theologists now? Yes. No, thank you. I think that they uh, you probably, I'd say it's fair to say you address this though it wasn't direct because I hadn't read the question, but Bitter Truth said they wanted it corrected. They said that their question was asking whether or not birth defects are punishments from God per se. And it sounds like you're saying that, we, I think we've heard your answer to that in the broader sense. This one coming in from Justin. Says, Jen, do you believe you and T-Rock have the same number of ribs or not? Do you believe you have genetic mutations and differences from your parents? Well, the first one, the ribs, I mean, probably. And your the form of your question is presupposing the truth of your assumption here. So you're saying, well, mutated from your parents. It's like, well, if I'm going to grant that mix a mixture of my parents is, a muta is derived from mutation, I'm not even sure that that's what evolution is actually saying. So I think it's important to clarify. I'm not disagreeing on the evidence. I'm saying maybe there's a better way to understand this stuff that is more in line with what's actually going on. You got it. This one from Bitter Truth Strikes Again says, let's debate religion versus evolution and see which one makes more sense by evidence. Why every single organism has four nucleotides. Both sides reply, please, and thank you. What was the question? Why does every single mm -hmm. organism have four nucleotides? Magic. It's a magical farting leprechaun just farted them out exactly as this way. It's perfectly consistent with all facts, and there's no like exclusionary data you can show to disprove that. So it's magical farting leprechauns. That's why. I have to admit, I have no idea why there are four. Why not six? Why not 20? Don't know. Gotcha. I'm not sure, but I'm sure if we studied it in greater depth, we would find there was a connection to the dimensional limit of the universe, which is three plus one. But it can also come out as seven and 14, depending on how what angle you're looking at from. So it's more complicated than just, oh, everything's four. But thanks for listening. You got oh. it. So real quick, um, this is basically what I categorize as a homologies argument. Um, you can look at um, skeletal formations and make homology arguments. You can look at DNA and make the uh, similar DNA argument, which is just a variation on homologies. And this nucleotide argument is the same. It's a homology argument the reason everything has that much commonality is because of the food source um if we did not have that commonality 
um, amongst all living creatures, um, our food source would not be viable for every living creature on the planet. The food source is plants, by the way, plants. So plants are created on day three before the animal life forms are and before people are formed because you have to have a food source for your living organisms. And in order for a worm, a bear, a deer, myself, a chimp, doesn't matter. In order for us to eat vegetation, we have to share molecular similarities to be able to digest it, process it, get the, um, you know, the, the growth, the metabolism, the cellular repair, everything we need from it. It ties to the food source and what the food source is made of. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Bitter truth strikes yet again. Say T-Rock, so the God, so God is punishing infants via genetic disorders. Okay, again, I, I'm just, it, it never ceases to amaze me that uh, evolutionists want to appeal to um, their version of theology or some kind of bizarre, vain philosophy when they can't stand with the, the hard science. Um, but philosophically, no, it's not a punishment. What I was describing a while ago was a consequence, not a punishment. If you, if you um, put the wrong fuel in your car, for example, there's a consequence. It's not a punishment. It's what happens when you do it wrong. Don't put water in your gas tank. Put gasoline in your gas tank so you can avoid the consequence, not the punishment. You got it. This one from Mark Reed says, after show on Mark Reed's channel. Mark, if you shoot me an email, I'll try to put that in the description box. Folks want to let you know, whether you be atheist, Christian, you name it, if you have an after show for any of our debates, we are happy to put that in the description box, no matter what side you're on, Christian, atheist, Muslim, you name it. Jake Nelson says, track evolution, you completely missed the point. I think it was T-Rock they meant instead of T-Rack. They say individuals don't evolve. Populations change based on environmental pressures. Get a member. Give you a okay. if you'd I, like. I completely missed the point. I never said anything about a an individual. However, single cell um, organisms do constitute a population um, in in sexually reproducing organisms. Um, Either you can have a male and a female, or you can have a fertilized female, uh, usually. So there is no misunderstanding of what the evolutionary model says. I'm well aware that the whole thing is built on populations and populations um, diverging over time and, and going separate paths and all of that. That's, that's brilliant, but you're still not addressing the hard science of how that is supposed to take um, scales to feathers. You got right. it. Tiny changes over long periods of time. This one coming in from, appreciate your question. Bitter Truth Strikes Again says, please explain what is DNA and why there's genetic variations. Creationists have no idea wrong. I can explain why the nucleotides are common. So I think first they're saying that the the evolution side can explain why nucleotide, nucleotides are common and also says, please explain though, T-Rock and or Jen, what is DNA and why are there genetic variations? Go ahead, Jen. What is DNA and why are there genetic variations? I think it's been established what DNA is already by the scientists the question is on the level of where did the first organism come from and what were its properties and there's unfortunately no way to go structurally in my view from the parameters of how we currently understand evolution to what we have right now it doesn't uh, understand the data doesn't clarify it and it certainly doesn't i think it's made pretty clear been made pretty clear tonight that it does not make predictions about the future as in animals that have not or life forms that have not existed yet oh so we can we rather can than trying to trick things, me into we'll answering yes to your question that presumes its own conclusion maybe think about some of the assumptions going in 
that uh, it's actually the material, the matter driving the changes rather than something else, like perhaps electromagnetic field so, which can readily be demonstrated. So the reason there are genetic um, uh, variations across the globe, and I'm going to use sexual reproduction because it's the one I'm most familiar with, but um, the human genome, for example, has um, it has about 3 billion uh, base pairs, right? So um, if if you do the simple math on that, you take four to the three billionth power and in, in, in a base 10 system, that's something like 10 to the 1.8 billion um, possible variations on that same quantity. But um, evolution is bent on the idea that you trace genetic variability through what what I'm terming um, nuclear DNA, which is basically the stable portion of a genome. Um, the nuclear DNA is is basically most of the protein coding stuff that tells you whether you're going to have bones, liver, heart, so on and so forth. And so they base their model on the stable portion, but there's a highly unstable portion of the genome as well. And in in male and female sexual reproduction, it's it's uh, for humans the X and Y chromosome, um, and those are highly um, uh, variable, and so they can't be used. They cannot be used in any um uh, long distant population studies because you run into a brick wall going past a few thousand years trying to trace ancestry of humans to uh, any kind of ape form um because our our y chromosomes are so different than chimps and gorillas um so so they basically have to ignore that and stick to the uh the, the part that's highly variable now the problem there is that um the the nuclear dna because it is meant to keep a human a human and a dog a dog and a cat a cat it has to be stable if it was not what would happen is one of two things either you would get extremely rapid so-called evolution or you'd get extremely rapid um, genetic meltdown um, in other words extinction really quick so um, why is there genetic variability in there? It's because the genome has designed variability in the X and Y chromosome and in what's called uh, microsatellites in, in uh, DNA. This one coming in from, do you appreciate your question? Timothy P. Southwick says, review YouTube Chan's Bravura Media Company, Geography Geek, wandering oh these are youtube channels they're recommending they're saying review these youtube channels bravura media company geography geek wandering wolf and dean megalithic technology i have no idea what i just recommended to everybody so hopefully those are appropriate <laughs> channels but do want to say a quick housekeeping thing folks if you enjoy these debates consider hitting that share button share the joy with somebody else as that's the completion of, you could say, enjoyment or love is sharing it with one another. But I want to say, Richard Taylor, last minute question says, T-Rock, if the ultimate food source was plants that need the sun for photosynthesis, how come the plants were, quote unquote, created before the sun? Um, biology 101, you can grow plants in artificial light, right? You don't have to have the sun to grow plants, and light was created on day one, three days in advance of the plants. They had light from the very inception of their creation, and uh, the sun is not strictly necessary for that. Bitter truth strikes again, says T Rock, your intelligent designer did a bad job designing. And human fixing those by treatment who is intelligent. I got the first part. They say, and human fixing. Man, I'm a bit of truth. I'm sorry. The second part, I'm so like pacemakers, we fix the bad design with pacemakers. I see. They're saying, okay. And humans are fixing those mistakes of the bad designer, they're saying via treatment such as what tom said in terms of pacemakers or whatever it might be as humans are intelligent t rock what are your thoughts 
<laughs> yeah, that's a really horrible argument. Um, you're saying bad design means not designed. That's log just a huge logical fallacy. But people aren't fixing; they're they're bandaging temporarily. Nobody wants a pacemaker. They would much rather have the healthy version of the heart. Things are deteriorating. That's genetic and thermal entropy. It's going to happen in this world. Um, and so, yeah, one of the most ridiculous arguments that an evolutionist could make against the creation model is oh it's breaking down therefore it wasn't designed yeah tell that to your honda in your in your driveway i think it's more god this one coming designer. from bitter god bad designer humans good designer that's the argument bitter truth says each person is unique dna carries the instructions for the development growth reproduction and functioning of all life so again wrong i think that was maybe for you jen earlier in terms of how dna was defined i don't remember uh, your exact answer i don't know if that's a question but yeah just keep repeating that and see maybe one day it'll become true this one from justin just justin no last name like share says creationists explain the vestigial feet that are whales uh, that whales have during gestation. Is that for? Can I answer that? Yes. I don't see how that would go against my model. It seems to actually support my model because the mind is remembering. It's like, oh, look, I used to have legs. Now I don't. But I still, you know, have that vestigial memory and I had to kind of work through it. I don't know. Thanks for asking. Embryonic whales do not have minds. Did you go into the whale uh, to ask them that, TJ? Yeah, the, the feet are vestigial prior to when the mind forms in the embryo. So the mind has to come later. It's not like the mind. Oh, yeah. Where does the mind come from? The brain. brain? The brain. Oh, okay. In the brain. And we this know that one because coming. of zombies. From Richard Taylor. It says T Rock. If the ultimate food source was plants that need the sun, oh gosh, I read that already. Bitter Truth says, what is germline or meiosis? Please explain, you guys, debating on evolution. T-Rock, you're still wrong. I, I didn't get what the actual question was. The, uh, <laughs> with that with that loving note at the end about you being wrong before they said before that they said what is germ line or meiosis i you know i'm not a biologist i can't give you any technical definition of meiosis that's going to mean anything to you but what i do know is is as i understand it what germline refers to again is something like nuclear dna in other words it's the common thread that um, both male and female in sexual reproduction would have and so that's the the, the whole reason that it's used as the standard for um, basically extrapolating uh, common ancestry across deep time is because it is highly stable. And the mutations that happen in it, um, this is kind of a genetic entropy uh, uh, question in a way, because um, what they're what they're trying to assume here is that uh, this this very slow mutation rate in the germline uh, proves evolution, but it doesn't. It's the exact opposite. Um, what what's happening is you have a repair mechanism and you have a reproduction mechanism. Neither one of those are part of the extrapolation, but in a thermodynamic system. Your efficiency is going to basically give you a, 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 a prediction about how long a system can last. So, for example, in automobiles, they, could, they only roughly run around 30, 35 percent maybe efficiency. And their life expectancy is rather short compared to a lot of biology for that reason. Now, compare that to biological systems where ATP synthase is something like 98 plus percent efficient. It's going to last much, much longer. Um, nevertheless, there is a reproductive system 
and a repair system. Those also suffer entropy. They're highly efficient, but they suffer entropy. And what that tells you is the actual uh, entropic principle is based on stacking those in an exponential fashion, as in 98% of 98% of 98% will give you the, the proper long-term efficiency of the system. And so, yeah, that's germline stable portions of the cell exist to keep you from melting down. Can I just you add one thing quickly there about meiosis? It's the type of cell division in sexually reproducing organisms that reduces the number of chromosomes in gametes. I don't see how that is actually a problem for me. I, I think the mind could be a perfectly good justification for the choice of which which chromosomes are retained and which are rejected. So I think it's the materialists who have a hard time accounting for how that choice was made because it would appear you need a mind to make a choice. You got it. Card in the Middle says, shout out to Modern Day Debate and shout out to D-Jump for coming on my show. Thanks for the awesome conversation, James. Thank you and all credit to the guests. They're the lifeblood of the channel. You can find their links below. This one from Theros Rex says, skeptics, our model has predicted many fossilized species in their precise locations and rock layers. In parentheses, they put Archaeopteryx, Australopithecus, Tiktaalik, thank you, <clears throat> say, etc. How do you refute this? Well, I don't need to refute it. I can just say that's not a prediction. Because a prediction is for something that hasn't happened yet and something that's been dead for a really long time buried it's, isn't it's in the I, future yeah i mean true uh i for me it's again it's non-discriminating evidence um they're they're the commonality between the evolutionary uh, paradigm and, and creation is that um the the fossil record represents somewhat of ecological zonation so all you need to do to predict tiktaalik is know which um ecological system to look in if you know that it's a uh, a semi-aquatic environment that's where you go look for tiktaalik at um if you know it's a you know more or less a tropical land-based environment um, then you don't look for Tiktaalik there because that's not where he would be found. You would look for things like birds and turtles and whatever. Um, so yeah, non-discriminating evidence. It does nothing to distinguish evolution above creation. This one coming in from, do appreciate it. Theros Rex. We got that one. Jake Nelson. Thank you very much, Jake. Says, Jen, maybe lay off the edibles. Incoherent speech is not a virtue. <laughs> Just say thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the uh, super chat. This is what coming in from Dingley Bumbus says, did T-Rock or T-Jump get their username first? Can either of them back it up with actual <laughs> proof? Mine came from, a, from an evolutionary process over millions of years to the T-Jump name. It's proven proven by like facts and old time I don't know not the leprechauns is. no no this is the leprechauns are the other ones leprechauns did the whole creation thing juicy this one from theros rex says also james what is your at here i got limited i think they mean super chats oh um oh yeah it's just modern day debate the channel name and Matthew Smelsher says starfish equal no brain organisms. Not saying there's a mind, but it is alive and functioning and making choices. Does this contradict mind equals brain? I think that's for the evolutionists, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, I was thinking to do. Wait, what? uh starfish starfish do not have a mind they don't make decisions they react there's no consciousness there how do you know what starfish think because they don't have a brain well, if they don't have a brain they don't think much of anything do they how do you know that evidence <laughs> empirical evidence I, of what, wasn't it richard dawkins that said the stuff that rocks dream of as in a, other words it's completely intangible you have no idea of knowing one way or the other 
Oh, sure. It could be completely outside of our understanding and frame of reference. But if that's the case, we have no way of investigating or knowing it. So it's indistinguishable from our perspective of not happening. You got it. This one coming in from. Do appreciate your question. Bitter Truth says, hilarious how you guys are debating without knowing biology. They didn't say who it was for. I mean, theoretically, it could be for all four of you. <laughs> I'm kidding. I think I know it's more based off of their previous questions. Jen and T-Rock, I assume based on their last questions that have all been toward you, that they're saying you don't know biology. I do know biology. Your mom. See, I know biology. That's true. I have not Confirmed. been indoctrinated into your cult. No, I don't know. Bitter truth. Are you satisfied with those answers? We'll go to the next one. They, <clears throat> let's see. Poor bitter truth. <laughs> but wait, let me just log. We're, I think that might be it for quite. No, there's bitter truth strikes again. They say, I am asking, did you find Adam and Eve's fossils so you can win? Can you show us? I got news for you. If you can't find Adam and Eve's fossils, you can't find Luca. You can't find the last common ancestor between chimps and humans. You can't find anything your paradigm claims except what exists today in today's world. Our, our paradigm doesn't claim Adam and Eve's fossils. They, <laughs> if you could uh, find them, they would be... A per, per the norm, you completely missed the point. Um, it's not about whether Adam and you find Adam and Eve's fossils. You can't find Luca. You can't find the last common ancestor between gyms and humans. You can't find any fossil that matters. Actually, we did. We already, we, already found we've, that. we've already found tons of those. And the question was literally about Adam and Eve's fossils. This one from... Maladia says a scientific prediction suggests that the data that are consistent with the hypothesis and thus can pertain to future and past experimental outcomes. Direct definition of scientific prediction, Jen. That's what they're saying it is, namely what they just gave. They want me to give an, a definition of a scientific prediction or they're saying no. that evolution definitely generates science. They're saying they're that saying, predictions are not about things in the future. You can predict things about the past as long as it's something you don't know yet. So predicting that there's going to be a fossil and finding exactly where it is is a scientific prediction. It's not specifically about things that happen in the future. Well, that's a claim. But I think if you wanted that claim to be true, you'd need to have something specific that wasn't just, well, I'm going to reassert my same flawed line of logic that leads to the idea that there's a slow and gradual change over time even though that's negated by the fossil record and just reassert my assumption i sort of if don't see only why. there were a way to test these things um there well we need to agree on what a prediction is right so in my view a prediction is something that hasn't happened yet and it wouldn't be called a prediction if you went back in the fossil record and say oh look what we found accords with a model that we understand is right because it makes all these verifiable predictions and tells us that over time we're going to evolve to maybe finally get our head out of our asses but uh, yeah there you go that's what i mean the difference is i think if you're looking into the past to call it a prediction is sort of a bit unclear you're kind of muddying the waters of science there a bit yeah, no, I agree. That's uh, that's one of my big complaints about how they extrapolate into the past. You can make up all the stories you want to about the past. Try that exact same methodology in, in literally predicting the future. It's a failure every single time. But, um, but Ember, if you want something testable, um, so I'm a big proponent of genetic entropy, right? So um, you want something testable, um, a, a good way to test genetic entropy, whether it's actually a problem or not, is to basically... Uh, accumulate a large amount of data in in you know say human populations where you get the most um data about disease and stuff like that and see if there's a general trend over time of the increase of frequency of breakdowns where things quit working um it's 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 super easy to quote unquote predict and and yeah you can literally predict the future on this one um the human genome is getting worse over time uh, a thousand years from now whatever time frame you want to put on it it will be worse then than it is today you you mean like how the average life expectancy has been going up for decades 
Um, sorry, that's not a, a proper root cause analysis. Um, average life expectancy going up is basically framed in the context of um, uh, large amounts of diseases like in the 17 and 1800s um, before people did silly things like they did in, in Europe during the 1800s where they were, um, I can't remember the name of the city, but basically where they were, the doctors were going into the uh, delivery wards, delivering babies. They were going down into the um, in into the basement and working on cadavers and then going back up and working on baby uh, delivering babies again they were transmitting germs back and forth um and then you got things like bubonic plague that uh, is basically a disease problem as well life expectancies went down during that period they came back up when people figured out how to wash their hands um so yeah there's been an increase in life expectancy if you quit doing stupid things that cause diseases and you quit having wars the genome is uh, so highly efficient that there is no reason, never was a reason to not live 80, 90, 100 years. <clears throat> this one coming in from Bitter Truth. You wouldn't believe it. Bitter Truth strikes again. It says religion just religion is just stories, T-Rock. Why should I buy that? Where's the evidence? Give me logic. Um the general uh, i mean I'll, I'll actually entertain that for a minute he keeps coming back and back like he's just desperate to have the last word um i would recommend you schedule a debate um based on pure scientific context um which i, I don't think you're able to uh, pull that off very successfully but um in order to actually entertain your your question what i will say is that in in science there are two ways to approach things. One's the empirical way where you collect data and form a hypothesis and, and do some math and try and figure out what happened. The other way is good old fashioned historical science. Guess which one trumps which? Um, historical science where you have um, eyewitnesses that can verify specific details that you cannot use a mathematical model to discern um, and, and I'll give a real good functional example let's say you find a volcano and in that volcano you do a and and, and um, you, you do a radiometric dating um, method like uh, potassium argon and you conclude that okay this this volcano is 400,000 years old okay find a piece of um, of burnt wood in the the uh, the lava, do a carbon uh, a fourteen date on it, and it can't give you anything over about fifty thousand years. But go find yourself a letter from a Roman soldier that he wrote to the to the uh, um, to the emperor and said, "Hey, uh, this volcano popped up in the middle of my field, destroyed my crops, my livestock. Send some financial aid." Guess which one of those dates you're going to believe in the secular community? It's the letter, the historical account that told you when it happened. That's the logic behind creation. This one coming in from do appreciate it, Malavia says Jen in all caps, and they sent this twice. That's how much they wanted to be sure you got it. They say Jen in all caps. I just gave the definition of an effing scientific prediction. How was this hard for you to understand? Because it's actually more complicated than just predictions with model you have to kind of check that the predictions it makes are exhaustive and accurate so what you've got is a description that can make sense of what's there like a language like english but english is not true or false any more than french is true or false so I want to bump it up to actually being science where we're quite certain we can follow it step by step and actually get insight as to what's happening in the process and i don't feel convinced that state of affairs with regards to modern evolutionary theories quite reach that point thanks for asking this one from justin says creationists do you know what stochastic processes are can you explain why they occur in biology you can spell just to be it sure you to get the word right stochastic said, means random huh stochastic means random just to be sure that you heard the word, it's spelled S-T-O-C-H-A-S-T-I-C. 
Is that for me? Well, they technically say creationists, which makes me think more like T Rock. But if you want to take a stab at it, I'm sure they're open. Um, well, sure. Cast, go ahead. Let, 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 let me read the um, the dictionary definition real quick. Randomly determined having a random probability distribution or pattern that may be analyzed statistically but may not be predicted precisely. Why do stochastic processes occur in biology? Is that generally what the question was? Yes. Because it's completely random what the biology or what the biota is going to encounter in the world. Um, it, it's kind of like your uh, the evolutionary model of the uh, impact theory for the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, uh, completely random what happens in the environment is, is the real point there. So um, again, that's a, a, a thermodynamics entropy problem. Entropy exists. That's why stochastic processes exist. But the so-called uh, randomness actually obviously does have order. Otherwise, you can't breed generation after generation after generation of fundamentally the exact same uh, life form. Yeah, stochasticity is not really a thing in my worldview. It's kind of again, another example of magical thinking where it's like, oh, the evidence doesn't line up with our model. Let's just insert some randomness so that we can have enough vagueness so that it's not totally obvious that this is wrong. So I think if a model has to appeal to randomness or stochasticity, then that is a big red flag because the model as much as possible should be determining the predicted result. That doesn't mean it's pure determinism because we have stuff like the uncertainty principle to contend with, but that is the flavor of science. Yeah, and, and you know, to that point, randomness is actually a very subjective idea. What's random to you may not be random to me. And what's random to you and me may not be random to somebody else. So why does randomness happen? Um, it's it's basically, how do you want to define randomness? Well, the atheist will probably take issue with this, but it's a metaphysical assertion that can't possibly be justified by the evidence because the evidence is going to support dependent arising much sooner than it's going to support randomness, which is in a lot of ways undefinable you got it's, it it's pretty easy to define it's a random number it, it, it cannot be predicted undetermined events that's all it is undetermined physics it's a thing we've proven randomness the so fundamental force of nature evolution it's has to evolution has to appeal to something fundamentally unpredictable even though it's a predictive model again yep. it just sort of seems yep. reality reality has indeterminate facts in physics it is it is a, just a thing we don't get an option it's reality is indeterminate you can understand how someone might think that sounded like an excuse well they can it's just a fact though like we tried to make it determinate we couldn't it's just a fact that it's indeterminate like oops we tried didn't work womp womp guess we just have to stick with a shitty model that makes no sense it always has to appeal to taking out parts of the brain okay cool yeah we have to stick with reality reality kind of determines if reality is indeterminate we just got to go with reality it's, it's, it's the way it is this one coming in from jake okay. nelson says a prediction is about something unknown if we predict being able to find evidence in the future about the past that is a successful prediction any thoughts yeah okay, if you I might be, agree. I, go ahead sorry if you want to be technical about it and say i predict i will find okay you're predicting the future that you will find and then you go and you find okay uh, i mean t jump may try to make that point earlier and it's not invalid um but again you're you're talking about comparing one model against the other you don't have different physical evidence than I do. We've got the same evidence. If we've got the same evidence, we can um, use very similar inductive reasoning to come to the exact same conclusions, even though our premises are uh, for the for the entirety of the model are completely different to each other. Yeah, it just kind of sounds like you're conceding that your model can't tell the difference between future and past. <laughs> What? And that would appear to be important because the future isn't like the past because of something called evolution. This one coming in from, do appreciate it. Dingley Bumbus says, Jen just gave her thoughts on language. Her thoughts on the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 and its obvious irreconcilable differences from modern linguistics. I think that they think you're a creationist, Jen. I. It was kind of hard to follow the meaning of that question. 
I'm well, not sure if I'm being I'm asked not... to comment on the Tower of Babel. Uh, Are you a creationist who believes in the, or, or I should say, even if you're not a creationist, is there a way in which you believe in the Tower of of Babel as described in Genesis 11, because they seem to think you do. And assuming that you do, correct me if I'm wrong, they say, and it's obvious that this passage has irreconcilable differences from modern linguistics. I'm not sure that it has irreconcilable differences, but I don't know enough to really comment on that in particular. You got it. You guessed it. Bitter truth says, dude, you had no idea what DNA is, nor meiosis, nor cell division, nor deletion or insertion, and debated on evolution. Isn't it hilarious? LOL in all caps. T Rock. T Rock, I think they're trying to get under your skin. <laughs> Armchair warrior. I I don't know. I'm I've yet to hear an actual scientist. I mean, he's not even in the debate. The 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 folks that are haven't brought any hard science. They have brought a bunch of philosophical perspectives, but no hard science. No, I specifically avoided philosophy just for you, T Rock. Can you show me your hard science again? That that's my intro. You can rewind the tape afterwards if you want. I'm not going to subject everybody to it again. Juicy. This one. Just let me reload. Uh, looks like we caught up. So I'm going to double check just in case there are any questions in the live chat. In addition to the ones that we've read, I do want to say, folks, I have to. If you did not know, I have to say this, you guys. It's going to be absolutely epic. As you can see. My dear friends, at the bottom right of your screen, Mike Jones of Inspiring Philosophy and Daniel Hakikachu will be debating the super controversial question of whether or not minor marriage is acceptable. And by minor, I don't mean like gold miners. I mean like underage people. It is going to be a controversial debate. You don't want to miss it. It's at the conference coming up on Saturday, April 22nd in fort worth texas watch it in person if you click on the link below in the description box for eventbrite you can find those in-person tickets otherwise my dear friends if you don't have plans for saturday april 22nd you do now even if you're from far away you can watch the whole conference live by throwing just a buck into the crowd fund that helps us cover the venue and the costs for example for tom jump to eat during this conference no joke we do cover the the, the uh, speaker like tom's food i mean look at him he's got these unusually large shoulders and he needs food for them so tremendous shoulders tom do consider watching live folks that's in the description box but for real tom does work out i know because i've worked out with him and he was on the elliptical the whole time like an old lady no, I'm kidding. That was actually me. But this one from Justin says, T-Rock, do you believe inductive reasoning leads to definitive conclusions? Also, can you explain the difference between an internal and external critique? Okay, the answer to the first question is yes, it can, if if, if good logic is used during the inductive process and you eliminate um, unnecessary and unwarranted assumptions, yes, inductive reasoning can lead to firm conclusions. Um, what's the second part of the question? Can I explain the difference between internal and external critique? So in an internal critique, which is what you really want to do, is you want to take the worldview and test it against itself completely eliminating all of the um the competing views so it's completely internal so you test its logic against itself external uh, critique is where you compare one model to another and and basically see if you can delineate significant differences between them you got it um just a question i thought we were all gonna eat subway at the event we can just show them your tattoo on your back just everyone gets subway isn't that how it works two meals will be part subway because at the <laughs> conference folks we do have if you sign up for the vip you can have 
food, lunch, and dinner with the speakers. And part of that is Subway. But we also get pizza because, you know, you don't always need to be healthy. You can have some pizza too. I'm a huge, I love pizza. But anyway, this one coming in from Justin says, T-Rock, do you believe... Oh, we got that. Sorry. Okay, that's in verse. It says, Timothy P. Southway says, why don't you all lying, cowering, cowards first come clean and fess up, you deceivers? God bless you all that are telling true as able and such, my friends. What does that mean? I don't even know what that means. Oh, bless you too, Tim. Let's see. I think they just wanted to tell us uh, how much they love us by threatening us all with eternal hellfire. Makes perfect sense. They didn't sense. quite mention hellfire. Uh, they just said, <laughs> you lying, cowering cowards. And fess up, you deceivers. I don't know. But I was, I thought, admit it. but I'm confused. I'm a liar. What, okay. the, truth, the truth is, is that I am, I am James's father. We've been lying this whole time. We're actually related. Me and James. Family. It's, it's true. true, and T Rock is T Jump's dad, and my grandfather. But my dear friends, Jen's clearly adopted. But want to say we we love all of our guests, including my brother Ember, and yes, we do appreciate all of our guests. So seriously, it has been a truly fun time tonight. I enjoy this. I told the speakers before I started that I just enjoy this so much. It puts an extra spring in my step. So I want to say thank you for you hanging out there in the live chat. We see you there. I'm going to put a poll in terms of who you thought was most persuasive. So feel free to vote on that poll. I'm going to be back in just about 60 seconds with a quick update on this upcoming conference, folks. You don't want to miss it. So stick around and want to say a huge thank you to Jen, T-Rock, T-Jump, and Ember, it's been a true pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Thank My you, pleasure. You.